On today's show, the San Diego Padres get Joe Musgrove back off the IL, but as they've been doing all year, losing to a bad team when you're trying to get above 500, recapping not just Joe Musgrove's start and the Padres' anemic offensive performance, but also taking a look at the rest of the NL West and some potential support that could come along the way, because I'm trying to be positive out here, and you should be too. Let's get into it. You are Locked On Padres, your daily San Diego Padres podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another edition of Locked On Padres podcast, which is part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day for Wednesday, May 22nd. As always, I am your host with sometimes occasionally, but certainly not always the most, Javier Reyes. You may be familiar with my other baseball-related work over at Just Baseball, where I write about not just the Padres, but general baseball stuff, and do a podcast about general baseball evergreen silly topics called Baseball vs. the World, which you could check out too. We recently did our favorite baseball movie scenes folks. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. It was a lot of fun, but you know, it's going to be even more fun talking Padres with y'all today. Um, look, the vibes for this team this year, it's over and then it's, we're back and then it's over and then it's really over. And then we're super back. This game was a prime example of that after coming off the series win against the Atlanta Braves, winning three out of four and not for the Padres offense going blank, uh, in that Sunday game, then maybe, or I'm sorry, the second half of the it felt like a Sunday, whatever. Uh, the second uh, Monday um, game of the doubleheader, uh, the Padres might have got that, gotten that sweep. Um, and they start off by getting blanked uh, yet again, uh, this time by the Cincinnati Reds. And yeah, um, there's not too much to talk about, which is why I said that we're going to have some topics talk about the rest of the NL West and some uh, pitching and batting and whatnot targets and some farm system updates. Just want to sprinkle that in at the end uh, because, man, Padres didn't perform yesterday and it was kind of a boring game. Like, if you watch their game recap, which I did because sometimes I like doing that to rejog my memory and, like, remember what the heck happened. Um, all the highlights were, like, individual at-bats. You know what I mean? Like, it was a nine-minute... Clearly, if you watch the MLB video breakdown, it's kind of like they're they're milking it. They're trying to stretch out what really was a nothing burger of a game for the most part. But that doesn't mean there's nothing to talk about, folks. So stay tuned. But also, today's episode is brought to you by eBay Motors. From brakes to exhaust kits and beyond, eBay Motors has over 122 million parts to keep your ride or die alive. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to bring home the big win. Eligible items only, exclusions apply, eBay guaranteed fit, only available to U.S. customers. Go check that out. Let's start, ladies and gentlemen, of course, though, with Joe Musgrove making his triumphant return to the San Diego Padres uh, in this game. He allows... He only goes three innings uh, as he just came back off the I.O., which was a little bit worrisome just because Darvish, when he got back off the I.O., it was full, like he went at least five innings. I will say that Darvish's injury was like a neck thing, and that was the type of thing that usually is just not that like big of an injury to worry about. Well, maybe Musgrove's injury uh, with some of the inflammation things that we heard or whatever, maybe they're a little bit worried and they really want to be careful with him. He goes three innings. Gives up three hits, amounting to two runs on two walks and three Ks. The runs were not earned as there was an error um, in this one. But alas, uh, it doesn't matter. It was a whatever performance from Musgrove as far as I'm concerned. Um, the Padres making two errors in this game, by the way, so that wasn't great. And it just shows you that like, that's kind of why Musgrove gave up two runs. This was a game where... The Padres just didn't have a lot go their way, frankly. Um, and that's not all in a bad way. It's not all in a good way. Um, they made decent contact at points. They just couldn't get it to go. But back to Musgrove for a second. I thought he looked okay starting off with a 50-50 strike call on Hurtubis. I think is that's how you say his name. Like, almost gets a strike out there. Then there was a slow roller from Ellie De La Cruz, which he beats out basically because of his speed. Then he hits Jake Fraley, which I was a little concerned about because the manager reacted after Jake Fraley got taken out of the game like oh man like I'm really annoyed because so much of the Reds has been injuries this year they've had so much of their team on the IL Matt McClain Spencer Steer players like that that have just been out I think Jonathan India has been out for a lot of this game he looks like he gets banged up at one point in this one after scoring um so so not great not great but uh Musgrove I think was able to work out of some jams I did like. Um, he, there was not much hard contact he gave up, which I think was more important. Ellie De La Cruz's double, which was a, a liner down the down the right field line that just he beat out and was able to get to second through speed. That was basically like one of the only hard hit like kind of balls that I saw. And then 
Um, not to mention, um, Campizano can't hold out. Not hold out. Can't hold on to the ball um, from Profar, which allows the very first run to score. So, like, again, errors. Errors galore and, like, just not the best fielding performance from the Padres. But, again, like... I just I like that he didn't give up too much hard contact. That's really what I was looking for. Um, across three innings, there's not much you can look into, frankly, for this guy, um, except for looking at what happened before and before he went on the IL. We're seeing the velocity tick up. Curveball was looking a little bit better. I th- I really do think that this is one of those things where it might be a carryover from last year, the injury. Um, the reason I have I'll say that for Musgrove versus say Manny Machado is because Manny Machado we don't know exactly when his kind of elbow thing popped up exactly. Like, I don't really know because he was really dreadful for all of last year too when it came to being clutch and the leader of this team and all that stuff. And I don't know when the elbow became an issue. If it became an issue at the beginning of last year, okay. But if it was like a third of the way through, it's like, well, hey, like you also were were bad before that and when you in theory were healthy. So that's why for Musgrove, I think like we saw him when he was healthy um, pitch really well. And he's been bad ever since they shut him down last season. So that's why I'm giving him a little bit more leeway because I feel like that's had more of an impact on his performance so far. But hey, that's just me. Um, the only positive, only positive from this game, frankly, um, like I said, Kippy's out of not holding on to the ball. That defensive stuff is a problem with him. He hits so well that he kind of offsets it. But if you're hoping for like an all-star catcher, it's not going to happen until he cleans up this defense. You know what I mean? And he makes these mistakes that cost the team sometimes. There are some framing issues every now and then that pop up. And it feels like, I I mean, I don't have the numbers in front of me. I feel like I've never seen him throw out a runner stealing, which granted is not necessarily easy. But again, he's just, I love him. He's great. The fact that he makes contact is awesome. You have to remember to always keep in mind that as a player, you have to compare him to other catchers because if you can get anything offensively from a catcher, that's a huge plus. And he just, he makes good contact. That's the big thing um, when it comes to um, staying alive in counts, I should say. Not necessarily the hardest contact in the world. And as someone DM'd me yesterday, uh, David Lamper, he was like, hey, he's out of swings like he hates the baseball. And I'm like, that's great. It's like Isaiah Pacheco of the Kansas City Chiefs who runs like he hates the ground. You know what I mean? That's kind of like KP's out except he hates the ball. Um, but he needs to be better. Um, he needs to improve defensively in order for us to get excited about this guy being a, a bigger piece than just like this fun bit that we love talking about on Twitter and talking about the hive and all that stuff. So we'll see. Um, the only other good thing that really happened in this game, Tatis, third youngest player to reach 500 career hits, only older than Tony Gwynn and Gary Sheffield, two names you might have heard of, uh, one being a Hall of Famer, the other being a fringe Hall of Famer. I think he, did he make it? I don't think he did. But anyway, Gary Sheffield, shouts to him. Um, that's basically it. Um, just a lot of bad from this game. Um, I want to quickly talk about Arise as well um, because I feel like I've gotten a lot of mixed responses from people saying that, you know, the, the Marlins have been awesome since Arise left, which I don't know. I have some people who have told me that maybe there's more to that with why Larissa Arise leaving has made the Marlins better. Maybe. I don't know. Uh, it's hard to say. But I think it's mostly just a fluky thing. This happens all the time. The A's won like nine in a row last year, guys. Like, relax. Um, But for me, I have gotten messages being like, I feel like Arise hasn't been that good. And I think there's a reason for that. And I'm not going to blame those people. So while Luis Arise is hitting well with the Padres, he's got 791 OPS, 350, 391, 400 slash line. He's doing everything you could ask for. And that batting average on base is basically what he was doing last year, like the entire season. So that's awesome, especially out of like one of your leadoff hitters who's able to just work counts, get in there and just make contact at the very minimum. That's very good. But I think one of the reasons people might be feeling that way, if you're a listener or viewer of this, is that he's grounded into nine double plays this year. Um, and he only grounded into nine in all of last year. And he's already had four with the Padres in just 14 games. So that might be why you feel like he hasn't been as good. He has had some brutal double plays where you're like, dang it. Like, we really could use the the grab ball. Like, not a grab ball. We really could use the extra base runner right now. So I think that's why people have felt like he's been a little bit bad. But even to those people, again, the slash line and also the game winner against the Dodgers. Guys, keep that in mind. If you're ever depressed... If you're ever depressed thinking about this Padres team, just remember that that walk-off was amazing and we were happy. Go watch it again. It's so joyful and amazing and kind of shows this team, right? This is a team that when they're winning, the vibes are amazing. And when they're losing, they look like they want to roll over, right? Like they just want to go to bed. I mean, I can relate. But that's kind of been the thing with this team. But yeah, um, we're going to finish up 
talking a little bit more about this game before we get into the rest of the National League West, which will give you guys some hope, I hope, um, and then talk a little bit about some additions and some farm system updates. But before we do that, I just want to give you guys one second to hear about something legendary, something fantastical, folks. Some might even say it's the best thing that has ever been made. Well, maybe not that good, but it is the best daily fantasy sports app on the market, folks. You know what that is? You got to know by now. It is prize picks. We love prize picks here at Locked On. They're fantastic. And here's the thing. If you want to get on the action, you can. Me, I'm interested. I'm interested in a lot. They've got some interesting ones going on today. Let me tell you. Let me tell you. When it comes to Padres, Luis Arise, one and a half total bases. I'm seeing it, man. I'm seeing it. And I think that this is the one guy who's been super consistent. And if I'm going to defend him against some people who haven't thought he's that great, over one and a half on Luis Arise total bases is one of the offers today from Prize Picks that you could check out. There's also Michael King over on Pitcher Strikeouts. Six? That might be a sneaky one that not a lot of people are looking into because what has Michael King been doing this year? He's been doing nothing but inconsistency. And he was bad his last start, which means he might throw a perfect game today. So those are my two recommendations, guys. But all in all, more than 3 million members over on Prize Picks. You just have to pick more or less on two or more player stats and watch those winnings roll in. It is really fantastic. They've got all sorts of options available for you that you can like and which you don't like. So don't worry. And, and, and also, and also, if you get a player injured or say like when Xander Bogarts was injured, two or less plate appearances, it won't count as a loss. So don't worry about that. They're not going to mess you up because of that. It's okay. It's okay. Don't worry. Prize Picks has you covered, folks. Go check it out. And because you're listening to this podcast, I got an offer for you. Download the app and use code LOCKEDONMLB for a first deposit match up to $100. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, download the app. Use the promo code LOCKEDONMLB for a first deposit match up to $100. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy with Prize Picks. And just like that, ladies and gentlemen, we are back here on the Lockdown Padres podcast, your team every day, free and available on all platforms, including the old YouTube. Follow me on Twitter at Javapeno, J-A-V-I-I-P-E-N-O. I said that way too fast. That was weird. I sounded like Eminem on Rap God. That was that was wild. J-A-V-I-I-P-E-N-O. Let's quickly um, summarize the rest of the game. Not much happens in this one. Again, only two good positives in this game. I already talked about one of them, Tatis, third youngest player to reach 500 hits. Awesome. Tatis, we can talk a little bit more about um, on the ne- next episode, but I will say um, Tatis just, it's just not happening at the moment. Um, I want to quickly mention though, horrible strikeout for Manny Machado on 3-2 in the sixth inning. I understand that Profar was stealing, but it was a 3-2 count and it was way outside. So really bad at bat for Machado. I will say, um, since we talk a lot about this podcast, how frustrating it is the way Manny Machado hasn't hit and the first pitches that these guys seem to swing at a lot. Well, in terms of Play, uh, pitches per plate appearance, that might explain a little bit. The Padres are ninth least in pitches per plate appearance this year, which again is not an all-encompassing stat. I'm just validating everyone's concerns. And Tatis and, tw- and Manny are the 20th uh, and 23rd, respectively, lowest in uh, pitches per plate appearance. But unlike T- uh, Machado, which is why I'd give Machado a lot more flack, is that Tatis actually has some better numbers, I think, under the hood. For one thing, we talk about weighted on base and expected weight on base. If you want to look at fastball specifically, he's been getting like obscenely unlucky if you want to look at it that way. He's got a 223 batting average on them this year. Last year he had a 264, which was, you know, not not amazing, but certainly not bad. Um, and his slugging percentage was pretty good on them too. 503, 526 expected slugging. So while he didn't always get base hits, he was getting some doubles and extra base hits off them. This year he's got a 223 batting average against them. Expected baggage of 299. He's got a slugging of 362 with an expected of 534. And here's the kicker. His weighted on base against fastballs this year is 331. He's got an expected of 413. A 100 point difference. So again, as much as I think that there's more to the numbers for Tatis' struggles, the numbers really are saying. Like, I'm giving you as many numbers as I can to say that Tatis should break out and, and blow up at some point. But I will say, with the pitches, the pitches per play appearance thing, like... He does have some of these outs where you're like, damn, come on, man. We need you to work the count a little bit more. Maybe when you're leading off. I understand swinging maybe a little bit more free when maybe there's runners on base, something like that, or if it's even just a runner on base. But to start off the inning, be no outs, and you get that first pitch, it's rough. It's rough. I feel like you need to work the count a little bit more 
um, when you feel like the team really needs to get a spark or something going. I feel like you got to be careful a little bit. But hey, we'll see. Um, at least he's been showing that he can hit the ball hard and not strike out um, at a rate that kills all of his value, the way that Manny Machado and, and Xander Bogarts have been playing this year. So that stinks. Um, that really stinks. But yeah, it's that. And then the other positive, aside from Tatis's 500 career hit, is the bullpen. A uh, good performance from the Padres' bullpen, yet again. They've been on a nice uh, stretch lately, especially over that Brave series. I think they really showed you what they were capable of, Jeremiah Estrada being one. But in this game, AJ Monahone, I know it's not high leverage. So to me, AJ Monahone is kind of like the, a little bit of, um, you know how like Dallas Cowboys, everyone tells you how good they look, but it's like, we all know this does that matter. We need to see the playoffs. For me, Monahone, I want to see some high leverage situations. I really do. Um, not that that is a nothing, because you had to take over for Musgrove after three innings, so it's not a nothing. Maybe it's a medium leverage situation, but two innings, one walk, one strikeout. It just feels like every time you're counting on him, he's, he has a tendency to explode, but we'll see. Johnny Brito, uh, one and two-thirds, two strikeouts, no hits, no walks. Very nice from him. Yuki Matsui goes an inning, doesn't give up any runs, and Stephen Kolak gets one out. Um, just not bad. I, I think Monahon was like really solid and got the job done, even if there was some weird... Red's chicanery and some weirdness with the way that they were swinging the bat. Um, even still, shouts to AJ Monahan. But folks, enough of yesterday's game. We've already talked about it more than I wanted to. I want to give some positivity and some optimism for you folks. And there's two arenas in which the optimism can be viewed, folks. Number one, and this is mean, but we're going to be mean on this podcast. Just look at the rest of the National League West. And I know that that's like a really petty thing to do when your team isn't playing well. It's to be like, yeah, well, you guys are worse. But the Padres are currently the second best team in the division with a 25 and 26 record. They have a plus 10 run differential, which isn't too bad. Um, and when you look at the rest of the division, there's been a lot of bad developments for other teams. Um, the Diamondbacks. Merrill Kelly is on the IL. Uh, I believe he's out for the season, if I'm not mistaken. Or at least I think he could be out for the season. Um, Jordan Montgomery is just getting like to them and he's got a 4.98 ERA like he's solid but he's just getting back and he got signed late so he's probably got that ramp up that he has to get through and then you've got Eduardo Rodriguez is still on the IL their big signing from the offseason now maybe when he comes back the Diamondbacks might look a little bit more dynamic but even still they've had a lot of injuries there Miguel Castro another one Christian Walker has not been super consistent for them this year um but the biggest thing is also Eugenio Suarez has been bad for them. That was one of their big acquisitions that they made to sure up for third base um, over in Arizona. And he has not been producing. And he's basically just been a power guy for the most part these last few years. He's not like what he was when he was with the, with the Reds. But he hasn't been very good. And then most importantly, out of all these guys, you know, yes, they've had some more. Kyle Nelson, Alec Thomas being hurt. But the big thing for me, I think, is Lourdes Gurriel Jr. That's one. One big player. And that guy is like a batting average dude a lot of times. He's performing really poorly after a really breakout season for him last year. So maybe last year wasn't very legit for him. But the biggest one is Corbin Carroll, and I don't think it's happening, by the way. Um, people that I just talked to, um, someone who's been on the show, Armley, and he thinks his swing is absolutely broken. Um, and that could be the case. Corbin Carroll this year has a negative .1 F war. He's hitting 191. He's got a 62 WRC+. And it, does, it doesn't seem like this is something that's going to get that much better. So again, while we're complaining about Machado and Bogarts, we're not the only team in the division with underperforming players. Um, the best player on the Diamondbacks this year, seemingly, when it comes to a hitting perspective, has been Ketel Marte and then Jack Peterson, um, which is wild because Peterson's a little bit of a defensive liability and can't hit against um, both sides of a platoon, let's just say. Uh, and Christian Walker, again, he's been okay. I don't want to hand Christian Walker. He's a guy that I've talked about that I'd love if the Padres got. But again, just an underperforming team. And remember that last year, one of the reasons if you were a naysayer for the Dimebacks was that they made the playoffs and made that run despite a negative run differential. And I know that run differential and the lucky stuff, if you improve your team and it's changed, then it's okay to be like, actually, no, I think that we can totally make it back again because we've made some additions. Um, and that's what the Dimebacks did with Eduardo Rodriguez, Jordan Montgomery, Eugenio Suarez, and then some, some bullpen help as well. But even still... Some of these guys, like your Carroll, the guys that were on this team last year, are not performing well. So again, the D-backs haven't been amazing. Next team, the San Francisco Giants, ladies and gentlemen. They have not been very good either. We already know about the Rockies, but the Giants have been a mess. Um, Blake Snell, absolute mess for them. I think it is more, not that Blake Snell's regressing. I hate that people are taking a victory lap on that, as if it was like, 
some wow, like who would have seen this coming uh, that Blake Snell would regress despite walking like every batter last year. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, congrats, guys. But for me, it's more that it's a, it's a slow workload, um, a slow ramp up. Hold on. I'm saying this wrong. The ramp up time was too fast. They signed him like a week before the regular season started. That's the type of pitcher. I mean, he uses the regular season to get into the swing of things. You know what I mean? Like as a Padres fans, you relate to that. So for you to be like just shoved, throwing him in there at the beginning, he's on the aisle right now. I think that's going to be a big miss for them. Jordan Hicks has been awesome this year for them. 2.38 ERA, but not getting a lot of strikeouts, not getting a lot of swing and miss. I think he's going to regress a little bit at some point. Logan Webb is amazing. One of the best starters in, in baseball, as far as I'm concerned. That's not going to change. Um, Kyle Harrison has been okay for them. But most importantly is their offense. Alex Cobb is back on the IL too, by the way. Um, but for me, it's been their offense. They just lost Jung Ho Lee for the season with a shoulder injury. That really stinks. I, I He was a player that I was really high on, as some of you may remember from the offseason. Um, I thought he was going to be great. But then you look at that offense, Tyra Estrada has regressed. Um, Wilmer Flores hasn't really done all that much this year. Um, Patrick Bailey, like Marco Luciano, like they just haven't been getting a lot. My boy, Michael Conforto, who started off really hot for this year, but he's on the IL right now. It's just, it's an offense that isn't consistent. So here's basically what I want to say is on top of the fact that the Padres are second in the division, on top of the fact that the Padres do currently own a wild card spot, they are in the third spot, which is all this team needs to do. I think even the naysayers and the negative people in Padres land, you would agree that Padres can make a lot of noise in the playoffs. They, they've just shown over the years that that's what they can do. And even the one year that they made the playoffs and it didn't end well um, in 2020, the top two starters in the Padres were hurt that year. And they had that amazing comeback against the Cardinals. So, again, this is a team that if they make the postseason can absolutely make some noise. So view it in that prism. Not going to beat the Dodgers. It's just not happening. Last year, it was exp it was predicted by some for it to happen, and it didn't happen. So Lord knows it probably won't happen this year, right? Um, but that's my thing. I think that that's one area in which people should be optimistic is that we're not the only team that has had a lot of things not go their way. And unlike those other teams, we've been excelling in certain areas, namely the offense and getting some bounce backs performances from like some big players and guys who have just showed up right from your Dylan Cease, your Hugh Darvish to new guys like Jackson Merrill and then Jake Cronenworth bouncing back and Jerkson Profar becoming God, right? Like all those things. Just want to say we're not the only one struggling, guys. So that's one thing. But there's more. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to get into it in just a second, ladies and gentlemen. But before we do that, I want to just take a quick second to talk about who I talked about at the beginning of this podcast, and that is the good folks over at eBay, and specifically eBay Motors, man. Millions of parts for your MVP. That's right, your ride or die, your vehicle, passion, drive, and patience. That's what you need to win. Well, eBay Motors has you covered. They have everything. To maintain your number one ride or die superchargers roof racks exhaust kits led headlights and more speed power style whatever you want they can you know acquiesce to whatever your your style is man if you want to be zoom zoom they can help you zoom zoom you know what i mean <laughs> no in all seriousness the best part about them is two things one 122 million parts and more uh that's just crazy. They have whatever you can need. I just mentioned some of the stuff before. Heck, they might even have those little smelly pine cone tree things that make your car smell nice. Maybe. I haven't checked. But they have everything. And what I like about them is they also have eBay's guaranteed fit, which is guaranteed to make whatever part you purchase fit your vehicle. They put like a little check mark next to it. Don't worry. You're burning rubber, not cash, when you use eBay guaranteed fit at eBay Motors because you won't buy any the TX2800 or whatever, when you needed the TX2700. Don't worry, they'll tell you if it fits your vehicle. So go check that out with all the parts you need at the prices you want. It's easy to make your car the MVP and bring home huge wins. Keep it alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only, exclusions do apply. eBay guaranteed fit, only available to US customers. Go check it out. And just like that, ladies and gentlemen, we are back here on the Lockdown Padres podcast. The waiting moments of this podcast, as you all know, I want to quickly talk about some things that might improve or maybe not improve the Padres as things go along. Because if there's one thing we know at the Padres, I was actually joking with a friend of mine yesterday that in sports world, it is so, let's so my friend's a Knicks fan, 
right? And he's like, it's so annoying that like they get a, there's like a hundred different stories about who the Knicks could trade for this summer because people who aren't basketball fans who don't know, Knicks are quite a big team, uh, popularity wise. They have a big fan base, and they made a really deep run, and they got a little bit unlucky, and they didn't have them at full power. So everyone say, oh, they they can trade for a superstar. They have all these picks. Bring the stars to New York. And yeah, part of that is that, you know. There's a lot of traffic generated from when you talk about the Knicks. You know what I mean? The same way when you talk about the Yankees and Dodgers, right? Like, that's just how it works. SEO, blah, blah, blah. You guys are smart. You understand it. Um, so there's, like, an incentive to point those things out. One of the funniest things about the Padres to me is that they get a lot of trade deadline, you know, trade rumor things. But I think it's not only, obviously, yeah, you want to get some some clicks and you want to get some attention. That's how this business works. But... It actually is totally fair because the Padres have made so many trades over the, the last, you know, four seasons, five seasons since I've been hosting this podcast. They've made trades, big moves basically every year, more or less. The only time they didn't was the off season before 2022. Um, that's the only time that I think they didn't really make big additions where it was like, I think Nick Martinez. And that was like the biggest thing they did. I think it was something like that. And they basically did not too much, signed some lower tier guys. They bring in Robert Suarez, who we didn't know how good he was going to be at first. Not much, though, right? And then this past offseason, not much aside from, though, they did do the Juan Soto trade, so that was big enough. So I think it's totally fair to look at this team as one that can make a trade for anybody. Absolutely anybody. And there's certainly some candidates out there. The biggest ones, I'd say, do depend on some other teams, though. So, for example, this Padres team this year has been really bad um, in terms of winning with the fifth starter. Um, with the sp- fifth spot. The Padres are 1-11, I believe. They could be 1-12 now. I don't know if this is um, uh, takes into account the last start. Um, but they're 1-12 in, in games started by Matt Waldron and Randy Vasquez. Now, I know all the naysayers. I know you'll yell at me. I thought you told us Matt Waldron wasn't that bad. Yeah, he hasn't been that bad. But the Padres have just not been able to score uh, enough when he pitches. And it seems like, again, talking about the bad vibe thing, one of the things about Waldron is that he has a higher ERA in those first three innings than his four through six innings, like significantly. And maybe that's part of it, is that the Padres, that vibe of like they roll over as soon as it feels like things are slipping or it might be like a big bad game, feels like they roll over. Maybe that plays into it when Waldron and Randy Vasquez start. Um, but they've had a little bit of a fifth starter problem, at least in terms of the winning, right? And while I don't think those guys are horrible, I think they might deserve a little bit more time to figure some things out. Um, clearly, it's not the future of the team at the moment, right? So when you look at them, you say, how can you improve? There's some starting pitchers out there, obviously. Um, if the Astros are, are, at, are out of it, which I frankly don't think will happen, that's my bold prediction, um, I'm just not buying that the Astros are going to finish below 500. They've got a minus seven run differential. They haven't been horrible. A lot of their starting pitching has been hurt. And I think their bullpen was so bad to start that it has to get better. So I don't think they're out of it. But let's say they are. Justin Verlander and Framber Valdez. Um, Verlander being the obvious one. He's the type of pitcher that I could see the Padres potentially trading for. Um, I don't think it would cost as much as Framber Valdez because Vander Valdez, if I'm not mistaken, is under contract for them. And there's a lot more control. And Justin Verlander, he does cost a lot, though. So I don't know if the Padres could actually fit that unless for some reason A.J. Preller um, like received the go-ahead. Or, hold on, aren't the Mets paying his salary, actually? I just thought about this. I think the Mets are actually... Okay, so maybe that would make him actually more expensive. I don't know. I don't know. I think they're only paying a certain amount. I'd have to look more into that, but I think that the Mets are covering most of it, if I'm not mistaken. I think they're covering most of it, but I could be wrong. All right, whatever. Framber Valdez, though, that guy, I just don't see them moving him. Um, So I would not be excited about those pitchers because, again, I just don't see it. He's an unrestricted free agent in 2026. You'd have to give up a lot more. And it will do that. And again, one of the things I've talked about with this Padres team is I'm not into blowing up this farm again. I just don't want to do it because that's what they've been doing every year. And what has it resulted in? One season in which they won 89 games and they made the playoffs and went really far. But it just there hasn't been a consistency with this team with all the star power. So maybe let's not keep doing the same thing over and over. So I wouldn't be into that. Um, There are some other guys out there. Um... Nah, not Jack Flaherty, because he's, he's, he just signed a contract. But there's some interesting ones out there that I think could be moved come playoff time. And actually, I think Jack Flaherty... Did he sign a multi-year deal? Hold on, give me one second, guys. One year, $14 million, Jack Flaherty. He's been really good. That's a name that I would keep an eye on, because the Tigers aren't quite there yet. And if it's just a one-year deal, I think it's totally possible that they move him and say, we're not going to re-sign this guy. 
He's been excellent this year, 3.79 ERA, but a 2.78 FIP, 2.09 XFIP. Whew. So he's getting unlucky. And he's striking out, guys. Jack Flaherty was a name for a reason, guys. So keep an eye on him at the trade deadline at the minimum. Um, and I'm bringing up a lot of pitchers because I don't think that the Padres are really, like, going to be interested in batters. I mean, the only one that would make sense that I've seen in terms of, like, big, big batters would be Luis Robert. And if they did Luis Robert, I bet you the White Sox are asking for Jackson Merrill in return because I know I would. Um, and I don't want to do that. You know what I mean? Why would you do that? And not to mention Luis Robert this year, if I'm not mistaken, hasn't been, like, that good. Is he on the IL again, by the way? Let me check that real quick. He might be. He might be. Yeah, he's only played seven games this year. My God. Yeah, so Luis Robert is like, I don't know. Maybe you can get him for nothing. That's not impossible. But again, I just think that with this deadline, there's really no bats. Basically, outside center field, and unless profile regresses mightily, left field, there isn't a lot to upgrade here. Um, which, by the way, is hints at what I've always been saying, which is that, I like it when your team isn't locked in place in so many positions. You've got Xander. You've got Arise now, but that's a little bit different. You've got Jay Cronenworth. You've got Tatis. You've got Machado. You've got all these players that are kind of locked in. And the players that wouldn't be locked in, and maybe you could improve, like your Profars, well, he's been amazing. You're not going to take him out. So that's one of the things about what I talk about when I talk about roster flexibility. I don't like locking in every single player when we don't know what the heck we're going to get out of all of them. Right? And that's what they're kind of suffering with right now. Um, but more importantly, I think farm system, I think, is a big thing for the Padres. Um, and yes, there are other targets out there. Mason Miller, when it comes to improving the bullpen. But guess what? They wanted Jackson Merrill. And I just don't want to give him up. I'm not doing this. I don't want to give up more really good prospects for good players in this win-now affair when I don't even know if Manny Machado and Xander Bogarts are going to be good again. Right? Like We don't know what we're getting out of those guys, so I don't want to overcommit to a team that might be falling apart at some point during this year. We have to see. If they're like six games above 500, then we can talk about it. But for now, no, absolutely not. I don't want the Padres to make big moves in order to catch up. The Padres can make, I would be still scared and nervous, but I'd be more understanding if the Padres make the big moves to go for it. You know what I mean? Like I don't want them to be making big moves to hope that they get to a good record and hope they make the playoffs. I want them to make big moves because they think these will help us win the playoffs. That's the distinction. Um, the farm system is where I'd prefer the Padres look into. In terms of the farm, there hasn't been a lot of great developments. Uh, Grant Pauly sent down. He's been playing all over the place, first, third, left field. Um, that's one of the things we talked about in the preseason was that he is just one of those guys that doesn't fully have a position. I think that people know for sure that he's going to play, uh, which is a problem, right? But in AAA this year, 127 Derby RC Plus, like, he's been good. He's been good his entire time hitting down there. I still hate the way that they treated him, but at least now it makes sense with Solano and with Arise. It's totally okay if he's not on the roster and you just want to use a Tyler Wade, Jose Zocar as pinch runners and defensive replacements. That's fine. But in terms of um, the rest of the farm system, it seems like there's only two guys that might be really, really good for this team. Actually, three. Alec Jacob is one. He's been pitching. He's been showing some signs. And the last guy that showed some signs pitching-wise, at least in terms of like relief pitchers, was Estrada, and that turned out really well. Uh, he's been awesome so far. Looks like the eighth inning guy for the foreseeable future. And then you've got Robbie Snelling, who in terms of prospects, he's the number one probably prospect for the Padres in terms of pitching. He's got a 3.44 ERA and double A. But, you know, I just, it's double A, and I think that, one thing I will say, though, is if the Padres keep struggling with this fifth starter thing, he might be one of those guys that they're really aggressive with and they disregard the face value numbers. They've done this a lot before. Um, C.J. Abrams being a great example. Um, frankly, Ethan Salas at a lower level might be a good example because that dude was struggling or just got to, what was it, just got into high A and then they immediately moved him to double A. So, again, Padres are very aggressive when it comes to this stuff. Um, but Snelling, I could still see him get called up at some point, depending on how he progresses, how he comes back, and whatnot. But the big one is going to be Adam Mazur. Uh, he's been the one impressing the most. He's been absolutely awesome um, as of late. Like, really, really good uh, for um, the Miners. I think that he's been very, very solid. He's kind of blowing up right now, and I think that if the Padres are going to call someone up, yeah, okay, why not? Let's call up the guy who's been playing well. He deserves it. Right. Even, and also, he's not the type of guy that I think has the highest upside. So I think it's OK. The ones that you don't want to mess up with their 
development as much are Snelling and Lesko. And Lesko, by the way, has been struggling. He's got like a nine ERA. He's not going to be ready this year. It's not happening. You know, I don't think anyone was expecting that, but it's not happening. Um, AAA last year, 1.95 ERA, only five walks. Um, and he's been really good in AAA so far. Um, so shouts to him. His last start, actually, he was great. Six scoreless innings in Frisco. Um, so the, that would be the thing that I look into. I think that what we could see is an Adam Mazur call up quite soon. I think we're going to get like at least one more start from Matt Waldron and Randy Vasquez. If both of those starts are bad, I think that they are going to call up Adam Mazur. I really do. I just have a feeling that they will. And they're going to look at the more immediate now thing and say, look, if we're not winning when these guys start, let's bring in a new face. Or they might even move Johnny Brito back into that, that spot. It's possible. But I do like what they've been doing, though, frankly. I like that they're keeping him in the bullpen for now. Bottom line is that the Pirates have a lot of options. Um, and I know that this was a little bit of a a not definitive, all-encompassing segment on this show today. That's because this Padres team is not definitive or all-encompassing at all. We don't know what the heck they're going to do every day. They could get swept by the Reds and then sweep the Yankees. I would not be surprised. It, they've just had such an inconsistency problem that it seems like they're trying to get themselves out of the mud. And in that sand pit of trap and death, as they're climbing out, they get past the evil monster that's been dragging them down, but then they slip on a stick. That's what it seems like the Padres. That was a horrific analogy, but you get my point, right? They're the types that have done all the hard work, but then the easy work they just can't go through. And the Reds are not good this year. We talked about this. They're 19, they're 20 and 28. They've been bad. They're the worst team in the National League Central. Like, they basically have had Ellie De La Cruz and then a lot of inconsistency everywhere else. And I already talked about, though, you've got some trade deadline guys. You know that they're going to go for someone. Um, I have already said my facts. I don't want them trading to try and get into the playoffs. I want them to trade if they think they can. it can help them win playoff games. Be in the driver's seat before you trade away more prospects, at the very minimum. Um, although... The problem, I didn't even talk about that. The problem is that A.J. Peller might get fired if they're not good this year. So even if they're not doing well, he might blow up the farm and trade Merrill for Mason Miller. So that might happen. But anyway, the rest of the division hasn't been very good. And I think they've had an equal amount of bad developments as the Padres. Diamondbacks, especially with Corbin Carroll, their little their literal best player last year, has been terrible. Right? So at least we have good players. Not so much them. And same thing goes for the Giants. So keep all of that in mind, guys. Hopefully that lifted your spirits just a tiny bit. If it did not, then I apologize. But as always, that about does it for today's edition of the Lockdown Padres podcast, the only pod that may be better than the Padres themselves. Remember to subscribe to the podcast wherever you get your podcasts from. Um, Tomorrow, I do not think we will have time. I do not think there will be an episode tomorrow. But we will be back on Friday for a crossover for this Memorial Day weekend series against the Yankees and maybe even do a little bit of recap, maybe some YouTube shorts um, on the developments over these next two games. But until that next time, ladies and gentlemen, stay safe. And of course, stay faithful. My fire faithful homies, take care.